I'm very happy with the invitation by uh, Fabrizio uh, because also uh, earlier this year um, he published this one. Uh, you might already have a copy, and if you don't, I can definitely recommend you uh, suggesting the title to your uh, library, uh, um, Santorio Santori and the Emergence of Quantified Medicine, and it's about Santorio from the late 16th, early 17th century, but it traces his impact throughout the early modern periods. And uh, one of the chapters is uh, written by me, and I will now present you uh, a shorter version of that chapter uh, tonight. And I'd like to begin with uh, the outbreak of an infectious uh, respiratory disease. Um, and it was named in the 18th century, the Qatar, uh, from Qataris, uh, from uh, the Greek Katarain, uh, meaning flow down. So fluids flowing down. Uh, in the early 18th century in the Dutch Republic, um, many cities were struck by an outbreak of this disease, the Qatar. Symptoms reminds us of the, the common cold. Uh, many sufferers coughed, uh, they had phlegm uh, running down their noses, and uh, they spat up slimy mucus stuck in their throat. And uh, confronted with this uh, influenza, the Dutch physician, uh, de Gorter, or Johannes de Gorter, let's call him John de Gorter. He uh, hypothesized that the winter cold was the cause of this. Uh, the extremely low temperatures, the high humidity, they would contract one's veins, thicken the fluids, close the pores, uh, suppress one's insensible perspiration, and hence bring out sharp particles and enhance the disease. Uh, the, uh, the treatment was simple, sweat it out. Um, so John de Gorter, he championed ammonia, sal ammoniac, as the method which draws out the matter of disease by insensible perspiration. Now, this treatment was based on an intricate theory of pathology. Uh, and in this theory, once nervous juice, the juices flowing in the nerves, they were thought to be obstructed and hence unable to come out of the body as perspiration. Uh, staying inside the body, these juices would turn sharp and cause the disease. But the chemical properties of ammonia, uh, John de Gorter argued, they would dissolve the thick and slimy snot, uh, open up the pores, and, and uh, hence be able to excrete the volatile malignant particles. And this would enable perspiration to normalize and allow patients to recover. Um, now, today I will focus on this famous concept of insensible perspiration. Um, I will also look at ammonia as a, um, a, a sudorific, as a, a sweating out um, medicine. And I will talk about the notion of uh, sweating out diseases. Um, particularly the Qatar, which I mentioned. Now, and the historiography of insensible perspiration has stressed the, the longevity uh, of the use of Santorio's uh, weighing chair and uh, methods of quantification. Um, and of course, most recently uh, here in this book, you can read all about the different perceptions of insensible perspiration throughout the ages. And the concept remained uh, a generally accepted phenomenon up until at least the 1800s. But this did not mean that it remained exactly the same. Um, so looking at um, extensive um, uh, publications in the Dutch Republic, and in particular to uh, John de Gorter's works and his understanding of insensible perspiration, uh, I argue that um, we can see a shift happening in early 1700s. Now, this notion of insensible perspiration originated uh, from ancient medical writers, uh, such as Galen, and Santorio breathed in new life into this concept, and the phenomenon was commonly accepted for centuries. Um, it was often referred to as uh, the Santorian perspiration or uh, perspiration of Sanctorius, and uh, in the 18th century, uh, Professor 
Albrecht von Haller in uh, Göttingen. He described it as such. If an intense cold could be suddenly produced in a closed chamber full of company, one person would not be capable of seeing another through the fog vapors which exhale from their own bodies, almost in the same manner as the poets feign the gods to be hit each in their proper cloud. So hence that's beautiful um, uh, description of the insensible perspiration and visualized here as a, a cloud a, uh, uh, of, of, of sweat being continuously perspired out of uh, your skin. Um, But despite Santorio's emphasis on quantification in medicine, um, his book, The Statica Medicina, also reflected uh, long-standing views on, um, on digestion. So the, the perspiration was closely aligned to digestion and health as, as the balance of the, the four cardinal fluids or humors. Uh, but as I tried to argue, uh, this shifted in the early 18th century when the operation of the nerves and the nervous system became increasingly prominent in medical understandings of insensible perspiration. So let's see how that goes. Um, Santorio, as a physician, uh, he was uh, very interested in perspiration uh, and he deemed it crucial to balancing the ingestion of food and the excretion of waste matter. Um, now, Santorio had designed his well-known uh, weighing chair, as you can see here, uh, a, a measuring instrument um, used to weigh all the food and drink that is being ingested and all the urine and feces being excreted. And you can see that on the engraving here as well, the table with the food and drink in front of him. And there's a, a, an assistant, Amanuensis, who is uh, reaching down supposedly to get the chamber pot from under him. At least that's what I would like uh, to read in this illustration. Um, the scale consisted of a large uh, steel yard with an adjustable weight hanging on one side, and, and you know, there's the chair on the other. Santori obtained very detailed data on the body's relative mass by measuring systematically over many decades. So it was very impressive. And he concluded that the insensible perspiration was not constant, but depended on internal factors, sleeping, digestion, and on external conditions, the weather. So I think it's very nice that in this illustration, you also see the room with a door where you can see outside. So it's uh, a reference to, to external factors and, uh, and the weather. Santorio's uh, books and aphorisms on insensible perspiration um, in relation to food and drink. Um, when we look at those, we can see longstanding views of, of digestion being reflected. So when awake, the stomach was filled with food, but when asleep, the food would be heated and broken down. Thanks to body heat, hot vapors arose from the stomach, transporting warm humidity to the cold brain. Um, and as these vapors condensed, they descended down, moistening and nourishing the internal organs or leaving the body if superfluous. Um, this is you know, um, a bit an, uh, more basic description of, of how digestion would work, but you get the picture. Um, Santorio's major contribution to this was providing detailed measurements. Um, he reported that insensible perspiration would add up as much as 40 ounces in one night. He considered the effect of different kinds of food on perspiration. He warned against eating pork, which could obstruct perspiration. And hence, while Santorio's uh, method was revolutionary and was used by many physicians uh, to come, it still functioned within humoral medicine. Uh, so for example, the chapters of his aphorisms were structured along the so-called six non-natural things, uh, airs, waters, places, food and drink, exercise and rest, uh, sleeping and waking, uh, perturbations of the mind, and the sixth one, excretion and retention was replaced by uh, um, 
sexual intercourse. But these six um, components, um, they had to be in balance. They, you could, they could be adjusted for health, but they could also be misused or abused and cause illness. Um, so Santoria was not out to replace old ideas, but rather sought to improve ancient notions of digestion, and, as well as Galen's uh, concept of perspiration, uh, but he transformed them by detailed measurements. So very different way of working. Now, based on his disunderstanding of digestion and insensible perspiration, Santorio argued that health rested in the balance between ingestion and excretion. And this perfect equilibrium depended less on the quality of ingested food and more on the quantity. Physicians calculated the correct quantity as follows. For example, uh, before a meal, one added a weight corresponding to the quantity of food as opposite end of the, of the beam. And the moment one had eaten and drunk sufficiently, the scale would tip over and the chair would drop down, signal, signaling the end of the meal. Uh, the function of Santorio's chair was uh, to determine the quantity of food taken at a meal and to warn the feeder when he had eat his quantum. And then I'm quoting now from a early 18th century encyclopedia by Ephraim Chambers. Santorio's chair, in short, was aimed at assisting early modern weight watchers, as has been argued, uh, and not so much aimed at gaining insights into uh, physiology of perspiration. Now, Santorio's work had a long-lasting impact, as I've said, um, and um, also uh, other chapters in, in the volume of um, Santorio, uh, they also deal with uh, insensible perspiration, but then in the works of, for example, Descartes and other 17th and 18th century philosophers and um, physicians. But uh, what set uh, the work of Johannes de Gorter apart from Santorio's? Uh, well, I argue that he aimed to shed new light on the internal physiology of uh, perspiration. How does it actually work in the body? And um, therefore, de Gorter um, shifted his focus from insensible perspiration related to digestion to the role of the nerves. So there are two reasons why uh, the Horter began to doubt the close relationship between perspiration and digestion. Uh, first, there were many different theories of digestion. Um, I've already talked about uh, ancient theories of digestion, but in the course of the 17th century, we've seen um, how digestion became to be understood in chemical terms and in mechanical terms. So for example, Van Helmont and Franciscus Silvius, uh, they argued that digestion came about by an active acid in the stomach causing a fermentation and separating nutrients from watery and other parts. So digestion and nutrition was understood as a series of chemical processes. And hence that was a very different uh, conception of digestion from, from Galenic thermal digestion. Uh, there's another reason why the Horter began to doubt the close link between perspiration and digestion, and that's because he started to do retrials, as well as uh, many other 18th century physicians, they did, they built their own weighing chair and made measurements, not as impact or not as extensive as Santorio did, because he spent decades on, on the weighing chair, but um, nevertheless, we get in this uh, table, we can see a few um, numbers that the Horter adopts in his uh, publications. And as you can see here uh, the, in the time frame, in Santorio measures that in 24 hours, he oozes out 50 ounces. James Keel in, um, uh, in Northern England or Scotland, I think, uh, Oozes out way less, only 30, and John de Horter 45. So that's actually quite close to Santori. Uh, but I, you see big differences between um, the, the amount of insensible perspiration that Santorio exudes 
at night, uh, which is the most, almost 30, whereas the Horta only 15. And in the daytime, Santorio uh, sweats 20, uh, whereas Jan's de Horta mostly uh, perspires during the day. Uh, so there's a discrepancy here. And so the Horter hypothesizes that in, in his case, in, in Northern Europe, um, perspiration had less to do with sleeping and hence digestion and more with, um, uh, with activities during the day. Um, so whereas in Santorio system, one perspired mostly once having eaten, and at night, the Horter, in fact, measured twice as much perspiration in the morning before uh, lunch. So there were some contradictions here. An important factor to reinterpret the internal functioning of perspiration was the uh, attention to the nerves. So many anatomists already throughout the 17th century, uh, such as Marcello Malpighi, uh, Frederick Ruys, they became increasingly aware of the profusion of the nerves throughout the entire body. And thanks to the microscope, anatomists found innumerable minute openings and sweat glands in the dermis of the, the skin. In uh, 1685, in Leiden, Govert Bitlow, he published a very detailed engraving of the skin, as you can see on the slide here. And you see different pores, skin pores. And revealing that a layer of the skin consisted of glands, excretory ducts, uh, hairs arising near the pores, papillary glands shaped like little pyramids. Uh, and these were composed of minute blood vessels or blood veins, uh, lymphatic ducts, and of course, nerves. So uh, John de Horter envisioned the nerves. Um, as pervious and tubular, and he argued that the source of insensible perspiration must be the, a very thin juice, the nervous juice flowing in the nerves. And so he says, today, nobody will deny that a very thin and mobile liquid flows through the nerves. He explained that the blood vessels discharged, discharged a, a jelly-like sap or gelatinous liquid into the nerve system. Um, and this juice would, uh, would lub uh, lubricate, moisten, and nourish the, the nervous fibers, as well as the outermost membrane enveloping the, the brain and the spinal cord. The nervous juice would find its way to the body, and once it had uh, fulfilled its purpose, it was used up, it would reach the skin, and it would be discharged as insensible perspiration. Um, nervous juice as a source of perspiration was supported by observation, uh, the nerves were permeated in the skin in much larger numbers than one would uh, reasonably uh, expect to be necessary for uh, sensory perception or muscular motion. And in addition, a greater number of nerves were located around the sweat glands than at any other location. So the Horter concluded that used up nervous juice was likely to evaporate as insensible perspiration at the body surface via the glands and directly through the pores. As many other physicians started researching the nervous system, the physiology of perspiration shifted from, uh, you could say, from the stomach to the nerves. Um, so how did this play out in practice? And so let me return to this uh, infectious uh, disease of Qatar. Um, in the harsh and, and freezing winters of the early 18th century, many started spitting phlegm and they had mucilage stuck in their windpipes. Um, and uh, these would keep the parts irritated and bring about an uncontrollable cough in an attempt to spit out uh, the mucus. Um, newspapers reported about this infectious disease, uh, for example, that um, King of Prussia, Frederick I, was struck by a dangerous Qatar, uh, a famous flow down, zinking in Dutch. And although he had improved four days later, he continued to suffer from a heavy cold. 
The case of uh, Qatar reflects the shift in perspiration uh, and the nerves as well for uh, the Khortar explained the causes of this disease in reference to retention of perspiration. Um, the, the retention, excessive retention of in insensible perspiration, he argued, would bring about morbid sharpness in the nervous juice. Hippocratic writers had already pointed uh, physicians' attention to the conditions of the airs and waters places as a central factor in people's well-being. And Santorio had uh, stated the influence on the weather, on perspiration as well. And so the Gorter, he took a renewed interest in the weather and he started uh, studying the disease of Qatar in relation to weather conditions. Uh, he used the weighing chair and he confirmed that the body exuded less insensible perspiration when in a cold than uh, in moist air. He was able to come to this conclusion by using his chair in combination with both a thermometer and a hygroscope, as you can see depicted here. Uh, this particular instrument, because um, it's great to see that uh, Santori already had many different um, uh, options, but and this continued in the 18th century when many uh, students and instrument makers were very creative in making various models to measure the humidity in of the air. And this one uh, was designed by uh, Peter Belkmeer, one of the Horter students, and he included this engraving in, uh, in his book. And this involved a, a cone-shaped body with a, a spiraling groove to fit along a wire. And uh, on the left, there's a sponge, number E, and there's a weight on the other end. And so as it's very moist in the air, the sponge would soak up and um, um, the, 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 the moist and it, its weight would increase. Um, and hence the coin would start uh, turning. As the Horter measured uh, less perspiration when the humidity was increased, he deduced that cold and moist air caused the smaller vessels in the body to contract. Um, and it would congeal the fluids, uh, it would close the pores and suppress the insensible perspiration. And when the retention of insensible perspiration persisted for a longer period of time, the, the abundance of the, the thin liquid contained inside the body was believed to uh, cause internal sores. It would agitate, stick to the lungs um, and, um, and mucous uh, membranes. And the Horter hypothesized two options to explain the presence of this sharpness in the body as having an internal and an external cause. The external sharpness entered the body uh, as sharp ingredients from either food or from the air, which, which um, have for a long time perspiration was not only exuding out, but also breathing in. So uh, the type of malignant particle or sharpness in the air could enter the body or and that's, the, more, that's the, the theory he developed the most, is that um, the thin and fine fluids inside the body uh, cause the irritation. So thin and fine and of such a nature that it demands to its treatment either an improvement or an excretion. So, um, so it's still a lot of is unknown about this sharpness, but it's very interesting to follow his, his way of thinking. Um, um, and the internal theory, the theory that it was developed internally, um, was stated in terms of the, the nervous juices. So either the nervous juice was not well prepared enough in the first place, or it was retained in the body for too long, uh, and hence it would become sharp by numerous circulations in the nerves. Then uh, a weakened body was unable to excrete these sharp particles the body was hurt and cut by the, the sharp sharpness. And, um, <clears throat> and the Horter located these sharp materials, mostly in the places where the insensible perspiration was ordinarily found, namely stuck between the nerves and their enclosing membranes and fibers. What to do about this? Well, 
course, sweating it out. So luckily uh, for uh, the many patients in, in the Dutch Republic, uh, De Horta had a solution. Uh, he wanted to treat Qatar um, with um, drugs that could dissolve the thick and slimy mucus. Patients simply had to take in sudorific medicines, so sweat-inducing drugs, uh, which lifted their obstructed perspiration, and they started a profuse sweat, and hence expelled the sharpness from their nervous system. And the drug which was supposed uh, to be the sudorific drug that most effectively achieved this was ammonia, sal ammoniac. Sudorific drugs, uh, or the less powerful uh, diaphoretic drugs, they existed for a long time already. Uh, within Galenic medicine, we have, of course, uh, Simplicia exhibiting hot and dry qualities, and they were thought to contain the property of dissolution. They were therefore believed to open up the pores, such as a blessed thistle, the Cardus benedictus, uh, but also aromatic angel's root, Angelica. Uh, the chemical processes such as distillation and sublimation introduced medicines made from the most potent essences of plants, animals, and minerals. Sweat-inducing drugs from chemistry included the, um, as you can see a picture here, silvery white antimony. Um, and these were sometimes taken with opium and uh, the spirits of uh, winestone, deer horn, and other stones as well. Um, well, despite the fact that there were so many different options for uh, sweat-inducing drugs, uh, the Horta had a real favorite, and that was ammonia. Um, and he thought that Salomoniac was the most effective treatment for uh, the Qatar epidemic. Uh, he mixed one part of an ordinary salt with five parts of urine, and then by sublimation, he gains the white, friable uh, substance called salmoniac. Sufferers simply held a bottle with salmoniac under their noses, and they drank 10 to 20 drops of sudorific with some beer every morning and evening. And uh, uh, John de Horter claimed to have successfully cured all his patients from this widespread disease. Um, de Horter's reasons for preferring ammonia over numerous other sudorific drugs was not simply based on trial and error. Also, uh, the neurological approach to physiology lay at its basis. So again, the role of the nerves are important here. He argued that ingested ammonia would be absorbed in the blood vessels and the esophagus and the stomach. And while in circulation, it would be discharged as part of the nervous juice and reach the infected skin, uh, the lungs, the mucous membrane. And it was here where the spirit of the ammonia uh, combined with uh, taking hot baths and, and stews, they would dissolve the slimy mucus. Furthermore, as ammonia had the chemical property of sublimation, uh, so turning directly from uh, uh, into vapor when, when heated, um, ammonia promoted the insensible perspiration. That was the idea. It freed patients from their symptoms by purging their bodies from all corrupt sharp and thin fluid, sweating out the slimy rawness of the superfluous nervous juice. So to uh, conclude, um, today I've presented you the case of John uh, de Horter. Um, I've also talked about sudorifics and of course, the insensible perspiration in the 18th century Dutch Republic. Uh, this has allowed us to understand important developments in early modern medicine. It affirms that the ancient notion of insensible perspiration was uh, continued uh, to be perceived as an essential to sustain health. Uh, and yet at the same time, it was subject to uh, change. It was subject to a new model uh, of physiology. On the one hand, we can recognize that John de Gorter built on uh, long standing ideas and practices regarding uh, perspiration. Concept of an invisible vapor continuously leaving the body had its roots in ancient Hippocratic writings and was generally accepted as a as very normal 
phenomenon. Um, also, the continuation and development of Santorio's quantification continued by the use of weighing chairs, thermometers, hygroscopes. So we can see a lot of continuations. But on the other hand, we also see uh, changes happening, uh, particularly in the way how insensible perspiration was understood. Um, physicians started focusing on the role of microscopic nerves and the nature of uh, individual bodily fluids, such as nervous juice. The Horter's study on perspiration incorporated neurological descriptions in an attempt to give a more detailed theory of the internal physiology of perspiration. Uh, furthermore, it allowed him to describe the pathology of respiratory diseases, such as catar, of catar and uh, to justify the functioning of his preferred uh, treatment uh, by sal ammoniac. And uh, because sal ammoniac would let his patient sweat profusely and sweat out the disease. So, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.